Thank you, Miss Peggy. Appreciate the good song tonight. Turn in your Bible to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We're going to look at verse number 14 this evening. John chapter 1, verse 14. Familiar passage. Uh, hopefully all of John chapter 1 is familiar to you. Uh, but I want to key in on this verse. Uh, the Bible said in verse 14, And the Word was made flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's look at that again. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So as we look at that scripture, and if we're going to have a Christ-centered church or a Christ-like church, then we have to understand and see what Christ became for us. In other words, uh, church is not about personality. It's not about the preacher. It's not about the choir. It's not about uh, what you want, what I want, what we offer to people as far as programs. A Christ-like church has to be centered around Christ. And as it's centered around Christ, then his personality, who he is, uh, is, starts to reflect on us. And so in this scripture, the word was made flesh, or in other words, Christ became, uh, it, it, he was manifested in the flesh. Now he's always been God, always will be God. But what we're seeing here is that uh, the, the writer, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was telling us that God manifested himself in flesh that we may observe who God is, right? We, we've never seen God. We don't understand. What we understand about God is what we read in his word and what Jesus portrayed in his life. And so think about it. God became flesh and dwelt. Didn't say he just sojourned. He stayed with us. Matter of fact, even after he ascended, he sent, <coughs> as it were, the comfort of the Bible says, so that we have God through the person of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And so we beheld or we see his glory. Now you and I have not laid our eyes on it, but through his word, and and I think sometimes what happens is we become so familiar with the word of God, we miss uh, how extraordinary Jesus was. If we put ourselves back in that day and the miracles he performed and what the disciples saw in him, you think about the Mount of Transfiguration when they heard the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased, hear ye him. Hey, we've never experienced anything like that. But as we read the Bible, I think sometimes we become so familiar with who Jesus is and what he did that we lose some of the awe of how wonderful it was to have God in flesh dwell among us. And so we see the picture of grace according to this verse. uh, He is full of grace and truth. And so what we see about the grace and truth of God we see in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus has to have the preeminence. Christ has to have the preeminence in the church. And as he has the preeminence in our life as individuals, then as we come as a body of believers together, then he has the preeminence in the fellowship. Am I making sense? We can't just make him preeminent on Sunday morning. He's got to be preeminent in our life every single day and every single moment. And as we live our life uh, in awe of Jesus outside the church walls, when we get in the building or the fellowship of the believers of the local assembly, then all of a sudden uh, it becomes about him or it should be become about him. And so to know who God is, we really only have to observe Christ. We don't have to speculate. We don't have to think or I I believe we really see the person of God uh, or the character of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus humbled himself to become a man so we could know God and so he could uh, reconcile us to God. Let me say that again. He humbled himself to become a man so that we could know God. That's him, amen? And so what did Christ become uh, when he came to earth and took on that robe of flesh. Well, according to verse number uh, this scripture, and as we know the Bible, uh, we turn over to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Mark this down. Uh, he became sin. In order for us to have Christ as the head of the church and the head of our life, We've got to see who we really are, folks. I think sometimes we think we're better than we are. 
The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 15, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So he became sin. Uh, he was sinless. He didn't hang on a cross because of what he did. He hung on a cross because of what you did. Amen. He became sin, but understand, uh, he was sinless. In other words, Jesus knows, according to Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 15, he knows what you're going through tonight. Now, listen to what I'm saying. I can give you scripture, and I can tell you what the Bible says, and you may look at me and say, well, that's all well and good, but you've not been through what I've been through. I may give you my advice. You say, I'd like your advice, and I may give you advice. You say, well, I'm not going to listen to that advice because you do not understand what I'm going through. But listen to me, church. You cannot point your finger up into the starry heaven and say, God, you don't understand what I'm going through. Because according to this scripture, according to this verse, anything you've ever gone through or been tempted with or trials you've gone through, Christ has gone through them. That's why he is the perfect mediator. He's the perfect advocate with the Father because the Bible said he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Now listen, if you're going to have a Christ-centered life and we're going to have a Christ-centered church, then the, the, the authority of the Word of God, your King James Bible, must have uh, the final authority and say so in your life. Let me say it again. I don't care what Oprah says. I don't care what Dr. Phil thinks. Doesn't matter what your favorite podcast. I don't really care what you read on Facebook. What I'm saying is if you're going to have a Christ-centered life, what the Bible says is important. Because, you know, so, sometimes people will, will put things up there and will say, boy, that sounds so good. I can relate to that. But it's not, it's not scriptural. It's not biblical. And we embrace it in our, in our flesh. And we say, well, I'm, I, they know what I'm going through. They, they understand me. And, and they'll give you some worldly advice that sounds good to the flesh. But we're not, we're not really living the Bible if we don't let the Bible have the preeminence in our life. If it doesn't have the authority, the final authority in our life, we're not really living for Jesus, are we? So Jesus knows where you are he knows where your trials are. He knows what you've been tempted with. He knows your heartaches and heartbreaks. He knows the tears you cry. You with me, church? And yet when he speaks, he speaks with authority because he's already been there. And so when you look and say, well, I can't do that, that's not for me. What he's saying is that he was tempted just like you are, yet without sin, so he has lived what you've lived, yet he is still sinless. It made him worthy to be the supreme sacrifice. See, without that, he would not be worthy to stand in your place on Calvary. He had to be sinless, so he was tempted just like you are. So when you say, but I can't overcome that, what he's saying is, yes, you can because I've overcome it. And, and, and if, if you're a Christian, if you're saved, now if you're like Christ, then not only is he in you, you're in him. So he was sinless, but then he was our substitute. Now we're building on something here. He had to be sinless to be our substitute. The picture of the lamb in the Old Testament is the picture of Christ in the New Testament. Y'all know that. I'm not telling you anything new. I'm reiterating, I'm refreshing what you already know. Every picture of that spotless lamb, that sacrificial lamb in the Old Testament was pointing uh, to the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, the New Testament. So uh, he died, listen to me, he died in my place. I've said it before, and I didn't. I, it's not original. I, I stole this, amen. He not only died for me, he died as me. He didn't just die in my place for me. He, he, he was a substitute for me. It, where I should have been hanging on the cross and where you should have been hanging on the cross, he took your place. Well, you ought to say amen right there. Amen. Why? He be, watch. He became sin uh, so God could deal with my sin 
without dealing with me. He became sin so he could go to the cross in my place so God could deal with my sin without dealing directly with me. I didn't have to suffer, Brother Johnny. I didn't have to die for my sin. He did. And if I did, it wouldn't have been enough. In other words, the, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal. Jesus, you can accept it one time that he paid for it one time for you, or you can continually pay for it and never pay it up. He became your substitute. Amen? If we're going to have a Christ-centered church, we have to see ourselves as hell-deserving sinners that should have died in our sins and went to hell, should have hung on a cross and never fully able to pay our sin debt, yet because of the grace of God, because of uh, grace and truth, amen, he stood in my place. And if we're going to have a Christ-like church, every person that walks in that door is at the same level. It's the ground's level at the foot of the cross. We're all the same. Amen? And so he became sin. Number two, he, he became submissive. Luke chapter 19 verse 10 says it this way. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. So, so what, what was he submissive to? He was submissive to the plan of God. So... When I look at this scripture, I realize that Jesus came for this one reason, to go to Calvary. Remember when he prayed, Father, not my will, but thine be done. In other words, he's saying, I may not want to do this in my flesh, but if there's no other way to purchase mankind, I'll drink from this cup. And so Jesus came to offer salvation, not just to Baptist folk, not just to good folks, not just to white folks, not just to American folks, to all folks. Amen? And, and, and if he was going to choose some, here's, here's the thing about it. If you're a Calvinist tonight and you say he... Uh, picks and chooses who's going to get saved. No else can. May I say this, Gentile dog? You're not the top of the list. I feel like he would select his chosen people and said, I'll just save them. And all those stinking Gentile dogs can just go to hell. But that's not what he did. But I've never met a Calvinist that their whole family wasn't selected. Not just one, but everybody in their whole bloodline selected, right? Now, I believe in household salvation, so do you. But I also believe this, that the salvation is offered to the household, but every individual has to make the decision to trust Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. So tonight, as you walk out of the doors of the church, understand that Jesus could have said no, but he was submissive to the plan of God. And so God had a plan and Jesus will fulfill that plan perfectly. You say, well, that, I know all that, preacher. Well, here's what sometimes we miss maybe. He was born in Bethlehem. He died on Golgotha, point A to point B. But inside the plan of God, there was a path. And so he was not only submissive to the plan of God, he was submissive to the path of God. In other words, every step to Calvary was ordered by God. Now you say, what's all that mean? If I'm going to be like Christ, first of all, I have to be submissive to the plan of God. He's left us here, Brother Eddie, for a reason. And the, the, the thing, Brother Bart, that let's be honest, if we're honest tonight, that we as God's people struggle with is what is the plan of God. Because here's what we want to know. What is your plan for my life? Not what is your plan 
for mankind. See what I'm saying? In other words, we want to be so focused in on what do you want me to do that we miss broadly what God wants us to do. I want to know this step, that is a path, right? But to know your path, you've got to know the plan. And the plan is that God left us here to share Him with everyone else. Yes. Because I think sometimes we miss that. We're so caught up in church service, what can I do at church? We, we forget that we're not here to have church. God didn't leave us here to come in three times a week and just worship Him. That's part of what we do. That's not all we do. The plan of God is we are to worship Him. We come together corporately to worship Him together in a church service. But as His people... His plan, uh, the broad plan is the same as what Jesus, to seek and to save that which was lost. Now I know tonight you can, you can look at semantics and say, well, preacher, we can't seek and save anyone. You know what that is? That's a cop-out. Because we're left with the Great Commission. And let's be honest. If we really thought that the problem was us saving someone, which we cannot do, then the Great Commission would not be the issue. All that is is obedience, right? That has nothing to do with God's power in my life. Now, again, don't get me wrong. Let me make sure I'm clear. We can't save anyone. But we do share the gospel. But let's be honest, we don't do a real good job of that. Because if we don't have a, well, Tuesday morning and Saturday afternoon, right? If you don't have a called time to go knocking on doors, most people don't do it. You say, well, preacher, maybe that means we ought to do it more often. Here's, here's what's interesting to me. We get all up in arms, right? And want less regulation and more liberty in our country. We don't want nobody telling us what to do. I 100% agree. Then it's like, preacher, if you don't have visitation, then that tells me I don't have to do it. Now, we want people to trust us that we got enough sense to get in out of the rain, right? But then when it comes to soul winning, planting seed, it's like, well, if somebody's not standing over me watching me do it, I'm not going to do it. We were shouting a moment ago. Got real quiet, hadn't it? So the plan of God was to seek and to save that which was lost. And it's still the plan of God to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, salvation has been completed. We just have to be the messengers. So the plan of God's still the same. Listen, I'm just trying to help you tonight because a lot of times we get so caught up in our little world about... Oh, look at all the bad stuff happening in my life. And oh, I'm going through all these storms and trials in my life. And you just don't know how hard it is. And we forget that there's a world dying and going to hell. Right? When we look at the life of Christ, friend, it was not easy. Everywhere he went, they wanted to kill him. Everywhere he went, there were people grabbing at him. Right? But it it did not deter him from the path. I understand we go through trials, we go through tribulations, we have obstacles in our life, we have pitfalls, we have discouragement, we have depression, we have all those things. Yet, let's be honest, the average Christian, it takes very little to get them off the the plan of God. When we figure out what the plan of God is to seek and to save that which was lost, and that's what we're here for, to share the gospel with them, then now we can focus in on the path of God. You're not ready for the path of God if you're not even participating in the plan, right? I, I hear, I, listen, I'm praying about what God wants in my life. I know what he wants. 
He wants you to share the gospel with every creature. We doing that? Well, no, no, no. I'm talking about ministry, what he wants me to do. I can answer that. Share the gospel with every creature. So every step to Calvary was ordered by God. Can you say that? I can't. Every step I take is ordered by God. I can't say that, right? Every person in his path was by divine providence. Every person he talked to, God, God put in his path for him to help. You know what we do? Let's be honest. We're so tunnel vision, God can put people in our path all day long. We miss them. You're at the grocery store, pushing your cart. Right? Somebody bumps into you. Hey, watch where you're going. You ever thought God just brought them in your path? No, we got to get our groceries and get out the door. Right? We're in a hurry. Somebody's faster than you. They're nuts. They're slower than you. They have a deficiency somewhere, right? What well, is? Every person that ever crossed the path of Jesus Christ was a divine appointment. You ever thought maybe that's what God's wanting to do in your life? I would, I would witness, but I don't have anybody to witness to. Everybody's a candidate. Unless you make them mad, then you ain't going to witness to them, right? So the, the path, every step was ordered. Every person that came across the path of Christ was divine providence. Every miracle was part of his path. Watch this. Every trial was a part of his path. We want the easy path, don't we? If I'm following God, shouldn't be anything, Brother Matt, shouldn't be anything in my way. Seemed like Jesus faced a lot of trials. But his final destination was Calvary. Can I ask you something? Where do you point people? Where do you take them? Down your road of sorrow? Down your path of pity? Or do you lead them up the mountain to Calvary? He became submissive. But then he became salvation. He redeemed. Sometimes as we sing that song, do we think about what it means? Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed by his infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. When he died on the cross, he paid the penalty, the sin debt, the requirement of God for you. Now, friend, if that doesn't excite you tonight, that no one else in this whole world may love you, but Jesus Christ loved you so much that he paid that sin debt, that his death satisfied God's requirement tonight, and you don't have to be good to get into heaven, and you don't have to do good things to get into heaven. Now, we do them because we love him, but isn't it amazing we don't have to earn our way to heaven that, hey, the, the sacrifice that Jesus made 2,000 years ago is as satisfactory to God now as it was then, and it will be forevermore. I'm thankful that he became salvation. I didn't have to earn it. I didn't have to get baptized into it. Hey, man, it was paid for 2,000 years ago, so his death satisfied God's requirement, and he reconciled God with man. Hey, Amen. I mean, as much as we tried to get up there, we never could. But that one day, as he walked up Calvary's mountain and, and, and the skies were darkened, he took the hand of a holy God and the uh, unholy hand of man and joined them that day and reconciled them. And you and I, 2,000 years later, sitting in a church on the side of Highway 150, can sing that song, Redeem, because of what he did and what he became 2,000 years ago. So he, he, he became salvation he redeemed and then he released what, it? what do you mean he released well by dying he paid man's sin debt 
in his burial and resurrection, he released us from the power of the grave. It's, it's remarkable to me how God's people are afraid to die. Now, I understand there's a side of us, the unknown, we don't know what's over there. But if, if I believe what I say I believe, there should not be a fear in me because he released us from the power of the grave. The greatest fear mankind has is the grave. Amen. It's our final enemy. But when he died, was buried and rose again on the third day and took the keys of death and hell, he overcame the grave for us. In just a few, next week or two weeks, I gotta get, I wish they'd just put it on one Sunday and leave it. Sometimes it's in February almost. Sometimes it's after 4th of July, it seems like. Just put it somewhere and leave it. If you're a rabbit, can't figure out where your house is, that's his fault. But we're going to celebrate not the death not even really the burial, but we're celebrating the resurrection. Hallelujah. Tonight is we think that death no longer has power over us. Heard some guy on TV the other day. He's, he's, uh, might have been on Fox News and he's trying to sell a book or a CD and he said, we want to look and examine what, God's, uh, what Jesus says about death. That when you die, you don't go straight to heaven. Because it, the Bible talks about them that sleep. I thought, pal, you're missing something. Because the Bible said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. My body may be down there, hallelujah. But my soul's there. And, and one day, that body that's sleeping is going to be reunited. Don't, don't try to sell a book, amen. Let's get it right. Let's, the, the book says to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And so we need to understand as God's people that when they put us in the ground, that ain't all there is. By the way, Let's not spend all of our energy trying to reform and remake what's down here when what we got up there is a lot better. And when the Lord comes back, he's going to fix it all down here. Donkeys and elephants can't fix what's going on down here. But the lion will. He'll, he'll fix it all just right. So if we'll stop focusing on this, right, not... Don't get me wrong, I think we ought to do all we can. We ought to vote right. We ought to, we ought to do all we can to, right? But at the end of the day, friend, this place loses and he wins. I see too many Christians sad. Oh, preacher, what's going on with America? You know what's going on with America. What's all this... What's all this transgender stuff in America? America's done. I 100% agree. But he's not. Hey man, he's not done. We're not done. Man, we're, listen, we're going to sing victory in Jesus. I'm on the winning side. We ought to start living like it. Why? Because he released us from the sting of death. The grave has no power over us. Man, aren't you glad one day when he comes back, uh, you, can be, you can be buried 14,000 foot down. You're coming out. Right? I, now, again, I, I, I think people ask me, I, they've asked me, and I understand now cremation is popular and it's less expensive, and, and I think the best way to be Buried is buried, right? But I've had people say, well, do you think it's wrong if I get cremated? I said, I don't know. 
I just know this. God sure can put all them pieces back together. Right? I mean, came from dust. We're going back to dust. Somehow he's going to put all that dust back together. How? I don't know. He's good. But we shouldn't fear it. We shouldn't fear it. He became salvation. He redeemed us. He released us. Then he rose. My friend, because he rose, I'll rise. Right? Because he lives, I can look forward to eternity. Because he lives, I can have victory today. It's not just victory one day over there. It's victory two day right here. Listen, God's people ought to be living in victory. We're not going to see a great revival until God's people figure out that uh, we can have victory on this side of the grave. But oh, look at all the bad stuff, preacher. Turn the news off. Right? Shut the computer down once in a while. Read the Bible. Well, you know what Sean Hannity said? Nope. I know what Isaiah said. Right? I know, I know what John the Beloved said. Praise God. See, we, we got to get back to that. He rose. You get that? Man, just a few, few weeks we're celebrating the resurrection of Christ. And before you know it, you know what happens? We, we get all depressed. Oh, it's so sad. Jesus died on the cross. He rose. Amen. Oh, I sure wish Mama could be here or Papa could be here. It's such a sad time of the year. Easter without him. But he rose. And if they're saved, guess what? They're okay. Amen. They're okay. They're better than okay. Why? Because he rose. And they're living in victory. We ought to live in victory. Man, if we're going to be a Christ-like church, we have to be victorious. When we come in here on Sunday morning, it shouldn't be with your lip hung down on the floor, dragging. It would have been a rough week, preacher. So? You have victory. And so tonight as we think about what Christ became for us, he became sinless so he could be worthy. He became submissive so he could fulfill the plan of God and the path of God. He became salvation for us. He redeemed me. He released us from the curse of death, from the power of the grave. And he rose. That's what we ought to be promoting, right? That's what people ought to know about us. Man, that's a happy bunch of people. I wonder why they're so happy. I wonder why they're so excited. I wonder why they're not afraid, right? I wonder why they're not depressed and discouraged. I wonder why when this world seems like it's just uh, falling by the wayside, I wonder why they have so much encouragement, so much hope. Why? Because he became these things for me. Now, if I'm going to be like Christ and our church is going to be like Christ, we've got to see ourselves as we really are, right? Brother Johnny, we need to stop focusing on the center part. That's who we were. Here's what we do. Boy, I tell you what, I'm just an old, nasty, wretched sinner saved by grace. You're, the emphasis is not on the right thing. I was a sinner saved by grace. Now I'm a child of the king, right? Does that mean I don't sin? No, sir. But I'm not what I was. See, we put the emphasis on what we were a lot of times. Not what we are today. Today, I'm a child of the king. Today, we ought to live like it. Stop living like the old sinner. Start living like a child of the king. Right? People ought to see that in us. And it should draw them to Christ. Tonight, we know what Christ became for us. Here's what I want to leave you with. 
What are you going to become for him? What are you going to become for him? It's not good enough to stay where you are today, five years from now. It's not who you were ten years ago. Whatever spiritual level you were ten years ago is not what you should be today. You surely shouldn't go backwards, right? We should be more like him today than we were a week ago. I hope you're seeing this year. Man, it, I, don't, it, I, don't want, I don't want our church to be like another church. We're not emulating someone. Let's just emulate him. Let's be like him. Nasty, wretched sinner walks in the door. Let's go to him. Someone who is backslidden comes in. Man, love on them. You're discouraged? Come get help. Well, let's stop living like we're defeated. Let's stop living like we're not on the winning side. Let's stop living like the world. Listen, you're not going to be like Christ till you decide not to be like the world. you got to come out from among them. Right? you got to get the stench off of you. We want to have a Christ-like church. We have to be like him and see what he became for us. And it puts me in the proper mindset that I don't think of myself more highly than I ought to and that I think of him a whole lot higher than I have been. He's worthy. Let's stand together. Amen. Bow our heads tonight. The altar's open. Amen. God spoke to your heart. You come tonight. come whatever your need is tonight Thank you, Father, for the message, and thank you for the power of God in our life to live for you. I ask you to continue to work on us as we realize we're not what we should be, but thank God we're not what we were. And Thank you for the power we can have that death no longer has reign over us and that we can live victorious for you. Thank you for every decision that's been made here tonight. We love you in Jesus' name.